We're wrapping up a, a series that we have conducted throughout the month of March on our homes and our families. And we've tried to structure this in a way that whether you are single or married, whether you are young or old, whether uh, regardless of the background family-wise that you have, there are things that, that we can learn from God's book about His will for our homes and our families. As we've emphasized throughout this series, there is a God, and He is alive, and He has a will for our lives, and it is simply a question of what we're going to do with that revealed will. We'll talk in just a moment about where we have been throughout this study, but you attempt enough home improvement projects, and eventually you're going to run up against an obstacle. There are some of you who live in apartments and condominiums, and while there are some negatives that come along with that, and while there are, are joys that come along with owning your own home, there can certainly be some headaches. Some things that you know eventually are going to need some attention, and maybe uh, they maintain, they, they, they stay up to date and, and working all right until you get to them. And, and then you can work at, at fixing those things or upgrading those things in your own time. And there are some Mondays or Saturdays that you had something entirely different planned. But one of those joys of home ownership rears its ugly head and... It needs immediate attention. Many of you know exactly the kinds of things that we're talking about this morning. In order to overcome those obstacles, whatever they may be, there are some basic, basic steps that we've got to tackle. If something is broken in my home, number one, there has to be a, a desire to overcome that obstacle. Maybe there is a, a leaky faucet or a squeaky door or a furnace that is out or, or, or any number of things. And, and I rationalize within my mind, well, it, I, I, I won't get to that today or I don't need to get to that today. There are other things that I desire to do. There are other things that are higher on the list of priorities and it'll be okay until I get there. And, and maybe I'm motivated in a variety of different ways. Maybe I'm motivated as the problem gets more and more and more serious. Maybe I am motivated by a spouse who gets more and more serious in their protests about what is going on. Maybe I'm motivated by the prospect of having company and making sure that, that I get to that and I fix that or I upgrade that as best I can before the company gets there. Regardless of the obstacle or what's broken or what needs to be upgraded, there's got to be a desire. I recognize the need. And yes, there are other things that are going on that can so very easily take my attention, but I'm going to set those things aside and I'm going to focus my attention and my desire and my energy on overcoming this obstacle. Major step number two, I've got to see or I've got to hear or I've got to read and access the necessary information. Maybe I've done that in the past. Maybe I had a father or a grandfather or an uncle or a friend who, who has been through this kind of obstacle and I've learned from them. But whatever the obstacle is, I've got to recognize it for what it is. And I've got to learn what I can in order to tackle that obstacle. Major step number three, I've got to understand the obstacle and I've got to understand the proposed solution. I may understand that there is water in my house where water ought not to be, but I don't understand the solution. And so I go hunting for people who understand it so that I might understand it because I understand nothing is going to get fixed, nothing is going to be accomplished until I not only understand the problem, maybe I thought it was this, but it's really that, 
and how to overcome that problem. Major step number four, I've got to apply myself and I've got to apply what I know to the obstacle. I may know what the obstacle is. I may know what is broken. And I may even know how to fix the problem. The only thing that is missing is me applying myself and what I know to the obstacle. We all understand that. That's very, very elementary when it comes to the physical homes in which we dwell. But I would encourage you to think about those four major steps in light of what we've talked about throughout the month of March. We've talked about God and His will for our lives and about how there need to be consistent evaluations and makeovers within our homes. Not the the, the physical dwelling places, but our homes the environments in which we live so that not only our joy is maximized, but God is glorified in our homes as He desires. In week number one of this study, we talked about how God has a blueprint for our homes and that blueprint requires a filter within our homes. We went back to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 and looked at that filter and and how very easily we allow things to flow into the environments of our homes that have no business being there if God is the ground and the foundation of everything. We talked about the termites of unrighteousness from Romans chapter 1 that can so very easily slowly but surely wear away the foundation of everything. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the founding virtues of a godly marriage that will keep erosion away from the foundation of our marriages that that we may be maintaining a whole lot of things all around us juggling work and families and all of the responsibilities around the house and in the community but allowing our marriages at the very heart of it all to slowly be eroded away we talked about the importance of locks on the door of marital intimacy that God has provided great blessings great gifts within the context of marriage but those must be zealously guarded and respected that there must be locks on the door of my marriage and how easily if those locks are not installed everything in a moment can be destroyed We talked last Sunday morning about the framing values of godly parenting. God has a role for the way that we handle these precious gifts. And last Sunday evening, from the youngest of ages all the way to to those who are oldest with living parents, we talked about honoring mom and dad, that God has a will for our lives regardless of, of where we are in the chain of development. God has a will for our homes. And I don't know about you, but throughout the month of March, we in the Harden household have seen things that need to be made over. Things that continue to need consistent attention. Things that need to change. Areas in which we need to grow and mature and so we come to this last portion of our series and I trust that your home your your individual life or your family is a lot like our family that the more we look into God's book the more we recognize there's growth that needs to happen there there's maturity there's progress that needs to be made here are the obstacles and here is what God is saying Now what? What needs to undergo some spring cleaning? What needs to be set aside? What needs to be implemented? And we return to these four basic major steps. Okay, I I hear what God is saying. But is there a desire there to overcome the obstacle? 
If there isn't a desire, I, I, I hear what God in His Word is saying, but if there isn't a desire to overcome the obstacle, nothing's going to change. And maybe there is a desire to overcome the obstacle. I don't want to continue living in, in this this environment that has been nurtured at home. I don't want my children to grow up in this kind of a context. And so I'm going to take the time to see and hear. Am I going to take the time to read and access the necessary information to implement this makeover? Do I understand the obstacle? Do I understand God's proposed solutions? And am I going to apply myself and what I know to maximize my joy, our joy, and God's glory? I would suggest to you that that's not just a, an arbitrary list, but that's exactly what we're reading in James chapter 1. You have your Bibles open there. The same process that James, an inspired messenger of God, has laid out for us beginning in verse 19. He has already in this letter talked about some very everyday practical things. And he says in James 1 and verse 19, you need to know this. Here is a messenger of God standing before us and he is addressing us as beloved brethren. And he says, you need to know this. My beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. That's step number one. That is not going to happen if I have no desire to change. I can read James 1, 19, 20, and 21 for the rest of my life. I can hear it preached. I can hear it taught. I can even be the one doing the teaching. I can recommend it to co-workers and those I go to school with. My neighbors. But if I don't have the desire to grow, nothing is going to happen therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word that's step number two I have to access the necessary information here's where I am here's where my home environment is and here is where God is calling me to be for my joy and his glory and I don't like where I am, but in order to get from here to there, I have to access the necessary information. I've got to treat it as the holy will of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. That is step number three. I've got to understand the obstacle and the proposed solution. But even if I've got the desire, and even if I'm hearing it, and I'm seeing, and I'm accessing the necessary information, and I even understand, okay, this is where I am, and this is where God wants me to be, and they are not the same, and here is God's proposed solution, there can still be a gap. And that is exactly what James begins talking about in verse 22. What you and I, at the tail end of this series, need to hear be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves hearing God's word and not doing it and expecting things to change is an exercise in deceiving myself 
hearing God's Word, talking about God's will for my life and my home, and not doing what I'm hearing and seeing and reading and expecting things to change is an exercise in deceiving myself. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, it is as if he has hung a beautiful mirror in his home. And I hear what God is saying and I want that and I sing about that and I pray about that and I tell my children this is the way you ought to grow up and live and I appreciate that in the homes of other people around me. And I look into that mirror and I see the obstacle. I see the ugliness. I see the progress and the growth and the maturity. I see the termites. And I know they've got to be exterminated. And I look intently, but then I turn around and I expect things to change, but I don't do anything about it. I at once forget the ugliness that I saw. But verse 25, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. It's why a page or two over in James chapter 3 and verse 13, James asks the question, who is wise? Who implements wisdom in their individual lives and at home? Who lives as if they have understanding? Who is able to be looked at by others around them and, and, and they say, I wish we had a home life like that. I wish we could grow to be like that. I hope that our children grow to be those kinds of people. That comes from good conduct that is shown by works in the meekness of wisdom. That's why James in James chapter 4 and verse 17 says, Whoever knows the right thing to do. God has a blueprint for my home and there are termites of unrighteousness and God has a will for my marriage. How I treat my wife matters. And there are locks to be on the door of marital intimacy. And children are a gift from the Lord that I am encouraged and told that I need to bring back to God. And God expects me even in the later years of my life to honor my father and my mother. And whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it is not building his house on the rock. That's sin. Knowing what I ought to do and failing to apply it affects me and it affects my family and it affects this family. And so the question is why? Open your Bibles with me quickly to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. Why? Why do people know and not apply? Why do we continue to allow our homes to be exempt from extreme holy makeovers? What keeps me on the other side of this application gap? I would suggest to you, number one, it is simply fear. Fear keeps people from doing the right thing doing what they know they ought to do it's all over the bible we think of peter who at that last supper with jesus is told along with the other apostles this very night you are going to deny me and in matthew 26 and verse 35 peter steps up and he says even if i must die with you i will not deny you and he motivates everybody else I know who Jesus is and I know that He has a will and I know this is what He's saying but I know this is how I'm going to act. It's going to be different this time. I'm going to do the right thing and we don't even get out of the chapter and in verse 74 Peter invokes a curse on himself 
and he is swearing, I do not know the man. This is what I know, but this is what I did because I was afraid. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, and the 42nd verse of the chapter. John chapter 12 and verse 42, we think about some of these Jewish rulers who actually believe. I hear what Jesus is saying, and I hear that God has a will for my life, and I even believe that it's true. Many of the authorities, John 12 and verse 42, believed in Jesus. Not just in in what He was saying, but they believe in Him. And yet, for fear of the Pharisees, they keep that belief hidden so that they won't be put out of the synagogue. And it all boils down to, I would rather be right with men and get glory from men than glory with God. Fear keeps me on the other side of the application gap. Or we go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus gives this famous parable of a master with multiple servants and the master is going away and he entrusts each of these servants with a certain number of talents. One of them had five talents and one of them had three and one of them had one and he goes away to a far country. And those men have the opportunity to use those talents as they see fit for their joy and for the glory and the renown of their master. The master comes back in Matthew 25 and begins to reckon accounts. And in verse 24, the one talent man says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. You reap where you do not sow and you gather where you did not scatter seed. And so what kept me from this is what I know and this is what I actually did and they don't coincide. Fear. I was afraid. And so I took what you gave me and I buried it in the ground. Could I ask you this morning, as you look into the mirror of God's Word, is one of the reasons you are not doing what you know you ought to do fear? I know God has a blueprint for my home and I know the termites of unrighteousness will eventually make everything collapse. And I know my marriage has got to change. I know I've got to quit the sin that can cost me everything. I know that the clock is ticking on my time with my children or my grandchildren. I know that I... Oh, my parents, honor. But I'm afraid of being brutally honest. I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of the unknown. I'm afraid of what others will think. I'm afraid of getting caught and what that might mean. I'm afraid to turn over control. I know this is what God is saying in His Word, but I feel like I've got a handle on it and I'm afraid if I let go and trust that God's way works, I'm afraid of what that will mean. What keeps people from doing what they know they ought to do? Number one, fear. Turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19. Number two, basic, basic selfishness. I know this needs attention. I know there's a leaky pipe in my marriage. I I know that the furnace of faith that I'm cultivating in in the lives of my children can't, can't last in its present condition. But there's just other things I want to do right now. It's the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 who comes to Jesus and tells him everything that he has been doing. And Jesus, knowing his heart, knowing where his greatest treasure lies, says, get rid of it all and follow me wherever I lead. And in Matthew 19 and verse 22, the young man hears this and he goes away sorrowfully. 
Why? Because he had great possessions and his great possessions meant more to him than Jesus. It's Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. At the infant beginning of the early church, there are those who are selflessly giving so that others might not have to go without. There is this great spirit of generosity. And Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife, get in on this. Acts 5 and verse 1, they sell a piece of property and Ananias, with his wife's knowledge, he keeps back part of it himself and he, he puts up this guise as if he has given everything. I want the renown of a great giver. I want the reputation. I want other people to look at me and say, wow, look at how magnanimous this man is. But my heart is still attached to my possessions. And God strikes them dead. It's Diotrephes in the third letter of John who liked to put himself first and didn't acknowledge any other authority beyond him. And he would refuse to welcome other people and act as if he and he alone was the definer of the expectations and the boundaries. It's Demas in 2 Timothy 4 who forsook Paul in a great time of need because he was in love with this present world. Why do men who have been married for three decades walk away from their spouse, throw away everything, for a fling that will at most last 15, 20 years, 30 years. Because in selfishness, they love this present, darkened, sinful world more than they love the God who watched the covenant being made. Why do mothers consistently fail to give their children the attention that they deserve. Wasting those precious years of shaping opportunity to mold those children into sons and daughters of God. Because there are other things they would rather do. Why do families put on masks in front of everybody else in assemblies like this and, and nurture for years the guys that everything is fine, everything is under control. We are a model family but live in a completely different way at home that is destined to eventually explode. Because admitting the truth isn't worth the price of laying down the mask. I like the mask. We turn quickly in our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25. Why do people know what they ought to do? Consistently look in, into God's Word and see, I need an extreme makeover and yet fail to do that basic garden variety apathy indifference laziness it's the person in Jesus' parable Matthew 25 and verse 42 who stand on the left side at the judgment not because they have been engaged in brazen immorality but they were apathetic to the needs around them those who were hungry those who were thirsty, those who were naked, those who were sick, those who were in prison. 
is the person described by the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 that, listen, this is where you are and this is how long you've been a follower of Jesus and this is where you ought to be, but you're not there. You ought to be able to teach and encourage and provoke others down this pathway, but you're not there because you've never in apathy and laziness and indifference grown beyond basic repetitive milk why do people allow needed makeovers to go undone fear selfishness and apathy what's the solution it's right here all over God's book Paul in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7 says, Listen to me, Timothy. Those of you who are in Ephesus, listen to me and understand this. God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. It's time to grow up. It's time to lay aside the fears of brutal honesty and failure and the unknown and, and what other people will think and getting caught in the loss of self-control and recognize God has given you everything you need to live in self-control. It, it is simply a question of whether or not you will apply what you know. In 1 John 4 and verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment is there confidence surrounding the destiny of your home and if not why not this morning as he is so also are we in this world there is no fear in love love that holds God is the greatest treasure of all and love that esteems others as more important than myself I live like that and there is no fear what is the antidote to selfishness? In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Why do I know what I know and not do what I know? Because I've yet to take up his cross. Because at one time I did, but I'm no longer carrying it in the context of my marriage or my battle against temptation or my efforts with my children. I know what Philippians 2, 3, and 4 say, but I just don't feel like living that kind of life right now. What is the antidote to apathy? James 4 and verse 17. It is a consistent reminder. This is what I know. And to not do it is sin. To hear the Spirit's encouragement through 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And so I ask you this morning, what will you do with what we have talked about in the month of March? Will you look honestly into the mirror of God's Word and compare what you find there with what you find at home? Single or married, young or old, male or female, Will you compare what we have seen with what is? And as you compare, what will you do with God's manual for life? You take out your song books and you turn them into the song of encouragement that God has selected. If you have never come to Christ as Lord, never confessed your need for him, never confess your belief that he is the Son of God, never been buried with him in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. We don't point you this morning to, to any type of human or, or, or church tradition or, or idea. We, we point you to the book of Acts, where people asked 
as they were convicted by this mirror, what shall we do? And we're told by Peter and the apostles in Acts 2.38, repent. This is what you know and this is where you are and the sin has got to stop and be turned away from and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Regardless of the father that you had growing up, there is a heavenly father who is perfect and gracious and willing to be merciful this very morning. Would you cross that application gap between what I know and what He wants me to do? If you're a child of God, one of the most fundamental things when holy construction hits a snag that I can possibly do is admit I need help. We know what that's like in our physical homes. To, to have some obstacle, something that needs attention that's, that's beyond me. I, I don't know what to do. And so I ask for help. And if this morning the holy construction of your life has come to a screeching halt, would you admit that you need help this morning? And would you allow us as your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray with you and pray for you, lifting you up, to our Father in heaven, who alone can solve all problems. If we can help you in any way this morning, I encourage you to come to the front of this auditorium while we stand and sit.